If we drop something, we know that it falls to Earth. It will experience acceleration due to gravity. Um, and gravity, gravitational force, is one of the four fundamental forces, and it's the one that we're perhaps most intuitively familiar with. So all objects are gravitationally attracted to one another, and the uh, degree of uh, attraction is uh, dependent on how massive they are, so their mass, and also uh, how far apart they are. So I'm attracted to the Earth, the gravitational force, but the Earth is similarly gra uh, gravitationally attracted to me. Um, but if, if I uh, were to, uh, to jump off the table, then I'll fall to Earth. Now, whilst it's true that the Earth is attracted to me, and you could say, well, the Earth should move toward you, uh, the, uh, the amount of movement that the Earth will undergo is so minimal that we consider it negligible. So we want to measure acceleration due to gravity, and the most simple way to do that is to use the simple pendulum. And in that, we'll have a mass on a string that's going to oscillate back and forth and back and forth. And the crucial thing is that we want to understand the forces on the mass at all points. And if we do that, and if we, we, we understand those forces, then we can, uh, we can describe mathematically the period of oscillation, which is the time taken for it to go back and forth to the same point. And we'll see that it's written in terms of the length of the string and also a constant acceleration due to gravity. So we have two variables and one constant. So if we measure the period t for a number of different string lengths, l, then we can uh, we'll see that we can make a plot and we'll be able to determine from the slope of that plot the acceleration due to gravity. Newton asked a very simple question. Why do things fall down? Newton spent a huge amount of time working in this area and he was the father of the field of gravitation. There was a force of attraction between all objects. So we call this F. And he said this force of attraction was dependent upon the masses of the two objects in question m1 and m2, the distance between them squared, and a constant, big G. Now, you might ask, why don't objects in the room go around and fly into each other if there is a force of gravitational attraction between them? Well, the reason is, is that this value here is very, very small. So it means for regular sized objects, such as we have in this room, uh, whilst there is a force of attraction between them, it's a very small force. It's only when we move to very massive objects that we really start to notice the effects of gravitation. So this brings us back to Newton's apple falling off the tree. So in that scenario, we can start to group some terms here. So we know values for g, we know a value for the distance between the apple and the centre of the Earth, and also we know the mass of the Earth. So we can we can combine these terms here, which reduces this equation F to a value called little g times m, the mass of the apple. And this value here is acceleration due to gravity on the Earth's surface, and all objects on the Earth's surface will feel this acceleration. And it's given by the value 9.8 meters per second squared. And the purpose of this experiment is for us to measure that value. So we can measure a little g using the simple pendulum. And the simple pendulum is just a mass m on a string of length l that is free to oscillate around a fixed point with an angle theta. So the first thing we need to do here is we need to consider the forces that are acting on this mass here. So the most obvious one, of course, being the weight, which will act straight down. And it's given by, where m is the mass uh, of the ball here, and g is acceleration due to gravity. And the other force that's acting in this situation here is the tension on the string. And it's given by t, not to be confused, of course, with um, the period of the uh, oscillating mass on a string. And as I said, this is free to oscillate around this point. So we also need to consider um, or break down our system here into x and y components. We define the x-axis to be like that, and this to be the y-axis. So the next step here will be um, 
uh, looking at our force diagrams in both the x and the y directions. And this is important here. So the first thing we should do here is we will break down the, um, the, the tension in the string into the x and y uh, directions. So here's the x component, where its value is given by tension in the string times the, um, the sine of the angle theta. The next one we want to consider is the force, let's just get rid of that, in this direction, in the y direction, and its value is given by t times cosine of theta. So now we'll be able to look and to compare the values of forces in both the x and y directions. So we'll just clear the board here. Okay, so let's look at our equations uh, in both uh, x and y directions. So firstly, x. Well, Newton's second law tells us f is equal to m a, or m x double dot to make things a little clearer. And this here is equal to tension t times the sine of theta. And this is a negative force because it's a restoring force. And that can be uh, expressed as minus t times x over l, where l is the length of the string. So we look now at the forces in the y direction. Here we have f is equal to m times y double dot. So we can write this as t times the cosine of theta minus mg. So we label these equations one and this one number two. So this is, these are incredibly difficult equations to solve. So we need to make some approximations. So the first thing we'll do is we'll say, let's keep theta very small. And if we keep theta small, then we can simplify these equations here. And the first thing we can do is we can say that the cos of theta, when theta is very small, is approximately 1. So that's going to tidy up this equation. The second consequence of keeping theta small is that the pendulum's deviation in the vertical y direction is much smaller than its deviation in the horizontal x direction. So this would allow us to put this second term here, the, uh, the, in the y uh, direction, so force in the y direction is going to be equal to zero. So with equation two equal to zero, we can now re-express it a lot in a lot simpler form. We can say f y is equal to zero, therefore t times the cos of theta, which is very small, is going to be given as t times one, so that's t minus mg. So therefore, we see the tension in the string is given by the mass of the, uh, the ball times the, uh, the acceleration due to gravity. So that cleans that up quite a lot. And now we can sub this into equation one. So we put that into equation one and we'll get, we'll get m x double dot plus mg times L over X equals naught. We can um, divide across by M, and that gives us X double dot plus G times L over X equals naught. And this, this is the equation that describes basically very fundamentally what's happening uh, to that mass on a string. So this, of course, describes bodies that will oscillate with simple harmonic motion. And we know that our, well, we hope we know that our, the solution to this equation is given by x equals a, the amplitude times cos of um, omega t plus phi, which is the phase, okay? And you remember, hopefully, from your lectures that omega is given by, or defined as, 2 pi 
over t, and this t is the period. And t, the period, is given by 2 pi times the square root of L over G, where G is acceleration due to gravity. So here we have the central equation for this experiment. Because we can measure things and are unknown as contained in here. So what we will do in the experiment is we will measure the period of oscillation for a different length, lengths of string. And we'll be able to construct a graph that relates these two objects, or these two terms, and uh, the, un the only unknown will be g, acceleration g to gravity.